The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Now, the hermit is ready. Ghost stories. Weird stories. And murders, too. <laughs> the hermit knows of them all. Turn out your light. Turn them out. Ah. Have you heard the story? The black band, eh? Then listen while the hermit tells you the story, just as it was told to him. <laughs> you ask me to tell you the strangest story I've ever heard. I did not witness what happened to Jan van Dirk, for it was long before my time. But I've heard my grandfather tell of it, as did his father before him. It is a story that's been handed down through the generations of our family. And it is believed. You see, this young Hollander, Jan van Dirk, was a relative of mine. When he was a young fellow, he went to Paris to attend the university. He came to France during the time of the French Revolution. And he suffered intensely because of it. The howling crowds, the bloody executions, stabbed at the very soul of one as sensitive as Jan van Dirk. He had one friend in this city in the throes of violence, Father Perishon, who liked the boy and often invited him to his small rooms. One afternoon, Yan came to him. Sit down, my boy. You look pale and hungry. I am hungry, Father. But I cannot eat. What I see on the streets, it turns me inside out. It is sad for one so young to see only this baser side of man. You need sunlight and only small shadows at this time in your life. Father Perichon, all of this horror, these scenes of cruelty, they weaken my faith in my fellow man. Why do you not return to your own country, Jean? As soon as I finish studying, I shall go. That is why I work such long hours, day and night, to finish the work, so that I may get away and try to forget. Time will help you, my boy. The warmth and beauty of your own land will blot out the place de la grave. You will marry... And your own life will make you forget the Paris you are witnessing today. I often wonder about the marrying part, I mean. You see, Father, I admire beauty so much. I know. Since I can remember, I've dreamed of only one woman for me. She is so beautiful, this girl I dream about. I don't think I can ever find her in real life. It is the beauty of soul that counts you. Oh, I know this girl I dream of has a soul of beauty, Father. <laughs> <laughs> Come, my boy. Let us eat of the little I have to offer. Outside of the visits with Father Perichon, Jan was a recluse, spending most of his time in the libraries, always surrounded with people, yet always alone, an escape from the realities of the present. One night he stayed in the library late, while there, a storm arose. But it was closing time, and so Jan was forced to step out into the storm to make his way to his lodgings in the old part of Paris. The lightning gleamed and the thunder rattled loudly through the narrow streets. He crossed the Place de la Greve, square where the public executions were performed. Just as he was passing the permanent guillotine which had been built there, a bright flash of lightning bathed the square in its cold blue radiance. The dreadful instrument of death loomed before him in all its stark ghastliness. Oh, how terrible. Yan shrank back in horror. His heart sickened within him, and he turned shudderingly away. Just then, there was a lull in the storm. Complete silence seemed to fall over the whole city. Then he heard a sound. <laughs> he turned back, and there on the bottom step of the guillotine sat a woman, crying bitterly. I beg your pardon. Can I do anything for you? May I not help you? No one can help me now. You've lost someone through the guillotine. Today I lost everyone. 
they made me come and watch as one by one they died. I wanted to close my eyes, but I could not. I understand. Horror kept your eyes open. But why stay here now? Why not leave this place? I have not to stay. I can still see them marching up the steps, the heavy knife being raised, the whistling thud as it fell, each time taking another of my loved ones from me. The blood of my father, my mother, and my two brothers mingled on the platform today. Have you no place to go? No. I have no friends left. They too are gone. You can't stay here. Come with me. I cannot accept your offer. I want to be your friend. I promise that no harm shall come to you. Here, let me help you out. I am very weak. You're shivering from the storm. You need warm food and dry clothing. Have we far to go? Not far. Across the Point Neuf. How strange it is tonight. All of a sudden, the storm has ended. And Paris is as silent as a tomb. Here, we turn this way. You are very kind. You need a friend. And so do I. How careful, these streets are very narrow. Do not touch the walls, they're covered with mold. Soon we'll reach the stairway leading to my apartment. Can you walk a bit farther? Oui, for you are fairly lifting me along. Here, this is my place. I'll carry you up the stairs. Oh, no. Of course. You're very light. And you're very cold. You should not have stayed out in the rain. I'll put you down until I find my key. Oh, yes, here it is. In a moment, we shall have warm, light, and food. Yeah, stand by the door until I light the lamp. Yeah, there. That's better. Now, come in, please. Now, sit down over here, and I will light a fire. Over here. What is wrong? Why do you stare? Sit here. I... I will have a fire going in no time. Then I will fix you coffee. I do not know why you are so kind to me. You are alone and lost. And so am I. Draw up closer to the fire now. Why do you still stare at me so strangely? May I tell you that you are very beautiful. All my life I've dreamed of someone just like you. I feel as if I had known you for a long, long time. You're safe now. You need fear no longer. It may be dangerous for you to harbor me. I am an aristocrat. I'm supposed to be an enemy of the revolution. You may find yourself in prison for giving me shelter. I'm not a Frenchman. They won't put me in prison. But I am an aristocrat. Yes, I know. I could tell. Not only from your beauty, but the black velvet band you wear about your throat. It has a diamond brooch of rare and costly design. It is all I have left. Will you tell me your name? Marie. And I am Jan van Dirk. Marie, I'll not let them find you. If they do, they will put me away where you will never see me again. Listen to me. I am earnest and sincere. All of my life I've been searching for you, Marie. Will you marry me? Oh, no. As the wife of a Netherlander, they can't touch you. You only pity me. I love you. I want you to marry me, Marie. It is true. I do feel that we met a long time ago. And so do I. I've dreamed of you. I've spoken with you. I've looked into your eyes before. But it is all impossible. Say my name, Marie. Jan. Jan. It is not impossible. I want to marry you because I love you. Perhaps you will not want me to be your wife when I tell you what happened to me today. I don't want to hear it. Our lives began when I found you in the Place de la Greve. I'm going out to get a priest, and we'll be married tonight, now. But the clergy has been forbidden to practice the rites of religion. Those who have not left Paris are in hiding. Oh, but I have great news to tell you. 
My only friend in this city is Father Perishon. Some time ago, he confided in me, told me that he is a priest. I will go and find him now. Marie. Yeah. You consent. We. Oui. For I love you. Yes, these two. One who had suffered untold horrors that day, and one revolted by the tragedies all about him, met on a dark night. Met and found that they believed they had known each other during some other hour. Met and fell in love on sight. Jan looked into Marie's soft brown eyes, gazed on the pale face, and knew that she was the girl of his dreams. With her consent to marry him, Jan rushed out into the dark night, now silent, foreboding as if the black skies were mourning for the dead. Finally, he arrived at the door of Father Perishon. He knocked. There was no answer. He tried again. Then he saw a wisp of light through the darkened door. Father Perishon, it is I, Jan. Step inside, my boy, quickly. Father. Father, I want you to come quickly. I found her. Found who, my lad? The girl of my dreams. I found her tonight. I want you to come and marry us now. Father, don't ask me any more questions. Come with me now and marry her. It's over. We're married. You belong to me now. We. Oui. For as long as he permit me to stay. He? Whom do you mean? Yes. If Shadow is always hovering over me. Why do you keep speaking of death? You're not going to die. We have years and years of life and happiness ahead of us. I wish it were so. Oh, how I wish it. Marie, come to the window with me. Take one last look at this view of Paris in the nighttime. For I'm going to take you out of this city of death and terror. Out into the country where we can live in happiness and peace. If it could only be so. I'm going to make it so. Tomorrow morning, I'm going out into the country and find a little villa, away from the blood and the hate, out into the sunshine, Marie. It will purify us. If you could do that, Jan, perhaps... No. It would make no difference. The angel of death is forever with me. You must not talk so. I will find the villa. Marie smiled wistfully. Somehow it gave Jan the hope that she would someday forget all the horrors and sorrow which now held her in their grip. They sat at the window, looking out over the sleeping city. They sat silent till the gray of dawn came into the sky, until a rosy haze was over the east. It was then that Marie's fears came back twofold. She was alarmed, quickly agitated. Jan, if you are going into the country, go now. Go now. I will wait until the sun comes up. No, it will be too late. Too late, I tell you. Go now, at once. You really wish it? What do you fear? You know, they will find Never. me. Never. And they cannot harm you. For you are Madame Jan van Dirk, a Netherlander. Oh, Jan. All right, my darling. I will go now. For the sooner I go, the sooner we will be away from all of this. We. Oui. You will be here when I return. You promise? I promise. Then I will start at once. By nightfall of this day, we will be away from here, you and me. Starting a new life in the world of peace. Marie, you and I in the world... Jan left. He walked out into the country. He had no trouble finding a charming place. A little house set in a lovely garden, the whole property surrounded by a high wall. Jan knew that here Marie would forget and be happy again. He rushed back to Paris as fast as he could and up to their little apartment. Marie! Marie! He threw open the door. Yes, she kept her word. She was there waiting for him. Exhausted from the tragedies of the day before, she was lying across the bed, head hanging over the edge, one arm thrown over her face. Marie, Marie, I found it. I found the most beautiful place you ever saw. A place far from this city of unhappiness. A place that will be heaven for us both. Wait until you see it. Wait till we... Marie? Marie? She doesn't move. She's not breathing. Her hand is cold. No pulse. No pulse. Marie! She's dead. She's dead. Help! Help! She's dead! She's dead! 
Yon has been away. They have killed her. Who has done this thing? Will Yon find out? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> tells us the strangest story he's ever heard. Goes on. Tells us of what befalls Jan van Dyck after he finds Marie lies dead. <laughs> Horrified and frantic, the young boy runs out of the apartment, down the stairs, babbling to himself, crying out in grief and terror, calling for help. And then an officer stopped him. Here, here, what is the matter with you? She's dead. She's dead. I went to the country. I came home and found her dead. Who is dead and where? My wife. She's up in our apartment. Come. Come, I will show you. You are not a Frenchman? No. My wife. Someone has killed her. Get hold of yourself. Death is a common thing these days. But to Marie. They had no right to do this to Marie. We will investigate. Over here on the bed. I found her here. Mm. She's dead, all right. <laughs> You say you left her alive and then found her like this when you come back from the country? Yes. Are you sure you did not kill her? No. No, I loved her. I loved her more than anything in the world. Yeah, let me get a good look at her. What is it, officer? What is the matter? How long have you known this woman? I met her last night, but I've known her forever. I met her last night. We were married a few hours later. You were married last night? Yes. Not a week ago, not two days ago, but last night. Yes, yes. Sit down in this chair. You are half crazy. Sit down and let me talk. Now, listen. Listen carefully. I saw this woman yesterday near sunset. I know who she is. She's the one I love. She's gone forever. Listen. I was stationed near the Place de la Grève. You saw as I did, weeping. I will tell the story if you will listen. Down the street near sunset came the howling mob. Crying for blood, intent on the kill. And down the street came the tomb, carrying its victims. Aristocrats whose time had gone. The family of La Tarant and the crowds following them. The tumbril drew nearer the square. The crowd cried out in fury. Then the cart stopped. Marie, do not fear, Philippe, my son. Have your eyes upward. Look at the sky and believe in God. We have out no one. We have done no wrong. We have never spilled blood. We have never hated. No speeches. Your time is gone. The guilty. Take us to the guilty. Mama, your eyes in the future, Marie. Look into the eyes of the setting sun. Get it done with. I am ready. One by one, the family of Monsieur Lafarin walked up to the guillotine. First, Madame, then the boys. And 
then, monsieur. And then the daughter. She stood there, her head held high, her eyes on the sun now almost gone. The crowd was silent for a minute. She seemed to frighten them. There was a pause, and then... trying to make me believe. I am telling you the truth. I stood at the foot of the scaffold yesterday when this woman in your rooms was guilty. No! She was alive when I left her early this morning when I went to the country. Late last night we were married. I can prove it. Look, let me show you. You see this black band around her throat? If I remove it, see? <laughs> if I did not overhead, it would roll to the floor. Now do you believe do you believe? No! No! <laughs> A fit of hysteria overcame Jan. It was the beginning of an hysteria that dragged him into madness. He spent the rest of his days in an asylum. The authorities never believed Jan's story. They said he had dragged a corpse into his room and in his madness believed that she was a living person. But to the day he died, Jan insisted that his story was the truth. And Father Perichon, he wrote in his journals, he too said the girl had been alive on the night after the storm. He said the date of her marriage. But it didn't tally with the hour and date of her execution. So no one believed. But as time goes on, the story has been told and retold in our family. I've often... Wondered if it were not true after all. Of course, Jan was a relative of mine. And he went insane. So you may think I, too, am touched with madness. But it is the strangest story I have ever known. supernatural, we who have delved into the unknown, we know that in this life of ours occur strange things that no mind can comprehend. Yes, turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. <laughs>